Come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'm going to share 22 stellar science fiction role playing games, which I believe are deserving of your attention and a place at your game table. But first, welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. You may have caught my 29 fantasy role playing games which aren't Dungeons and Dragons video. And in the comment section for that video, there were quite a few people who asked if I would put together a video like that one, but focus on science fiction role-playing games. You asked, I try to deliver. So that is what this video is all about. But before I take a look at the first game, I want to point out a few things. First of all, this is all off the cuff. None of this is scripted. It's all one long take. So if I mistakenly say something about a game or a publisher or designer or what have you, and I'm wrong, I apologize right up front. I am certainly not looking to mislead anyone. Also, in the fantasy role-playing game video comments, there were people who were saying, oh, I can't believe you didn't talk about ABC game or video fail. You didn't talk about XYZ game or a particular publisher. For the most part, if I didn't mention a game or a publisher, it's because I'm not overly familiar with the game or a particular publisher. I mentioned in that fantasy role-playing game video that I was sharing games that I could essentially personally vouch for that I had reviewed or one of the correspondents at the gaming gang had reviewed or that I knew someone personally who played it and highly recommended that game. I talked about those games. So if I didn't mention something, I meant absolutely no disrespect to your favorite game or your favorite publisher. Now there were a few that absolutely slipped my mind that I should have mentioned but mainly, I hadn't reviewed those games, so they weren't at the forefront of my mind when talking about those various games, or I should say failing to talk about those various games. Do you want to mention, there are two publishers I do not provide coverage for. It's Palladium and Steve Jackson Games. Just a personal thing. My website, my channel, my choice. Now, I'm not telling you not to support those companies or love their games or even mention in the comment section that their games are your favorites. That's completely up to you. It's just a personal thing. I do not talk about those two companies. All righty then. So let's jump on in because first off, we've got games that I don't have personal copies of anymore to share with you or I've never had a physical copy. So we're gonna talk about those first. Now, some of these I did have physical copies of, I did reviews, and because I knew that those particular games were never gonna leave my shelf again, I made sure to get them in the hands of someone who would use them. Somebody who would get them to the table with their gang. Because there's, in my opinion, nothing worse than me reviewing something, and then it just sits and collects dust on the shelf. I mean, that's not what a designer and a publisher were looking to do when they invested all that time, effort, money, and love into a game. So there are some games that I've reviewed, really liked, just knew that I wasn't gonna play them again. So that's why I don't have the physical copy to show off for you. First off, we've got Coriolis, which is from Free League Publishing. We are going to hear from Free League a lot. So this is an interesting science fiction role-playing game. The setting is unlike anything else out there. It is the third horizon. So it's kind of like we've seen empires fall in the past in this game world, in this game setting. And some of these cultures are are picking up the pieces. And there's, nobody's at war at the moment, but there are serious political tensions going on in this 
There is a massive three-part campaign, which is available for Coriolis. The production quality of every release I've seen for this setting is top-notch, excellent artwork. This has a very Middle Eastern flavor to it as well, not only in the character designs and fashions, but in the actual game setting too. It's very, very cool. But like I said, not like something that you've seen before. This does utilize the year one engine from Free League Publishing, which powers many of their role-playing games. You basically have a dice pool of six-sided dice. You can have so many that you roll for a task or, or a challenge you're trying to overcome, and you're looking to roll a six on any of those dice in order to succeed. And normally, the more sixes you roll, the more successful you are. Very easy to wrap your head around those mechanics. If you are in the market for something that is unlike any other science fiction role-playing game out there that's, that's not just building on your science fiction tropes, Coriolis is certainly worth a look. Now, if you're a fan of William Gibson, Bruce Sterling, and other cyberpunk authors out there, then you need to look no further for your role-playing game experience than Cyberpunk Red from our Telsorian games. Now for decades, pretty much everybody's go-to cyberpunk role-playing game was Cyberpunk 2020, also from our Telsorian games. It wasn't that long ago that we got Cyberpunk Red. In fact, this came out prior to Cyberpunk 2077, which is the same game world. And Cyberpunk of course, Cyberpunk 2020 predates Cyberpunk 2077 by decades. So that video game is actually based on this game world, if you weren't aware. But I like Cyberpunk Red because it pretty much updated mechanically, not a, it's not vastly different, but it is different than Cyberpunk 2020 and it has a far more modern mindset and aesthetic to it as well. So there's a lot to recommend. There's a starter set that's available that has everything you need to jump into Cyberpunk Red, pre-generated characters, an adventure, the rules, handouts, dice. Like I said, everything you need is available in that starter set. So if you are looking for a cyberpunk setting role-playing game, then you can't do any better than Cyberpunk Red. Next up, we have another standout science fiction setting, which is very unlike most that are out there, and that is Fading Suns from Ulysses Spiel. This is the fourth edition, which came out. The physical books, I think, I want to say came out within about the last two years. There is quite a bit of content that is out there for this edition of Fading Suns as well. So this is kind of a dying galaxy. We've got uh, empires in collapse. And like I said, dying galaxy, as, as you see by the title of the game, Fading Suns, there's a lot of political intrigue with this game. This is, uh, there's a, like a cast system. Uh, involved in this setting as well. Quite unique, not like really any other role-playing game out there. In some tiny ways, you might draw some comparisons between Coriolis and Fading Suns, but not a lot. And this has a very unique look to it as well. Now, I, I have had some folks say, eh, the artwork I've seen for Fading Suns kind of looks like Dune. I completely disagree. Yeah, okay, maybe it's got kind of a desert look to it, but there's far more alien creatures and different races and that in Fading Suns than you'll ever find in Dune. Now, I'm not knocking Dune. I'm just saying this is not Dune. And this has a very passionate community behind it as well. So Fading Suns from Ulysses Spiel. Next up, we've got the first science fiction role-playing game ever released. You got it. It is Metamorphosis Alpha, which 
This edition you're looking at right here, this is the Deluxe Collector's Edition. This is available from Goodman Games. This is the first edition of the rules. I believe they're on a fourth edition of the rules, but it's not from Goodman Games. It's from, uh, off the top of my fire something <laughs> games, if I remember right. But Goodman Games releases adventures for Metamorphosis Alpha. In my opinion, and once again, I could be wrong, so I apologize up front, but to my knowledge, I think Goodman Games is really the company that's been releasing adventures for Metamorphosis Alpha. In fact, they've got a big campaign book for the Warden, which is the generational colony ship. It's this massive ship that is the setting for Metamorphosis Alpha, and the player characters are, well, normally they're colonists. You can you have different sorts of characters that uh, are awakened and find that the Warden, things are not as they should be. And one of the cool aspects of Metamorphosis Alpha is because this is such a giant ship that you can have all different kind of science fiction memes and tropes. So you can have an area of the ship where aliens have invaded and colonized. And you have another part of the ship where the robots are, are in rebellion. It's, it's really cool and very, very interesting. Plus, of course, it's old school, which I am a fan of old school role-playing games. I've also heard that it's, it's kind of a red badge of courage to play Metamorphosis Alpha with its creator, James Ward, and be killed off by him at a convention. <laughs> so this can, like I said, it's old school. It can be very deadly for the player characters. Next up, we've got Numenera from Monty Cook Games. I originally reviewed the first edition of Numenera. I have not had a chance to take a peek at this edition. And I liked Numenera quite a bit. For one, there's loads of content out there for it. So this is not a role-playing game where you're going to pick up the core book and say, oh, okay, now what? Because there is loads out there. Now, there are two, I don't want to say core books, but the first two books that came out for this new edition were Discovery and Destiny. Discovery is the core rule book, and I think, that Destiny just brings more of the Ninth World to the fore in that book. I don't think it's like a Game Master's book. I could be wrong, but I don't think it is. This is... I know some people look at this like it's a fantasy role-playing game, but I've always looked at Numenera as a science fiction game or maybe science fantasy. And even looking at the artwork on the cover of the book would lead you to believe this is a science fiction role-playing game. This came out uh, trying to break the mold of Dungeons and & Dragons, and I think did so successfully. And this actually led to the Cypher system, which is the generic system that powers pretty much everything that I'm aware of from Monty Cook Games. So if you learn Numenera, you can also use the core mechanics for superhero adventures, horror, and quite a bit more. So once again, lots and lots out there. This is kind of a setting where there's, there's been all these past epics, uh, past like civilizations that have fallen. This is the ninth world. This is kind of the, the ninth go round on the planet. So there are a lot of like ancient technologies and things like that involved in Numenera. It's a standout setting and, like I said, loads of content for it. Speaking of loads of content, Savage Worlds from Pinnacle Entertainment, the uh, Adventurer's Edition, which is the latest edition of Savage Worlds. I know some folks think of fantasy role-playing games when they think of Savage Worlds, especially with the relatively recent release of Pathfinder for Savage Worlds. 
I always think of science fiction and horror. Now, one of the cool things about Savage Worlds is it's genreless, and there are all these supplements out there with all these other settings that you can use Savage Worlds with. So I believe there is a brand new edition of the science fiction, it's either the Compendium or Companion, that's on the horizon. I think it was supposed to come out last year, but it was delayed. So that is either coming soon or just on the horizon. And there are tons and tons of different settings that you can plug into Savage Worlds. Now, Savage Worlds isn't necessarily rules light, but it is also more focused on storytelling than in simulating a combat encounter that takes four hours to play. So there is some crunch, but it's not real rules heavy either. And really one of the things going for Savage Worlds is simply the sheer amount of content out there for you to essentially play any sort of setting that you want. And there are a lot of science fiction settings out there. Can't talk about science fiction role-playing games without talking about Star Wars. That's right. Which originally came out from Fantasy Flight Games. And when Asmo Day did a restructuring, Fantasy Flight Games let go of the Star Wars license and it was picked up by Edge Studio, which is still part of Asmo Day. So it's still, you're looking at the same high quality artwork and production quality that you came to expect from Fantasy Flight Games. Now, I've always heard great things about this role-playing game. I have not played it. I'll be the first one to mention that. This is also another game that gave birth to a generic role-playing game, which uh, is the Genesis system, which is what powers Star Wars, but Star Wars gave birth to that. And there are a few different core books. So if you're looking for one core book that has all the information about smugglers and Jedi powers and uh, the Empire, you are not going to find that. So there are separate books. I know that's turned off some people, as well as the fact that this is uses custom dice. Now, the custom dice still have your traditional number of sides. It's not like, oh, we're rolling a 26-sided die. And there's also the app, which is available, so you don't really have to go out and buy dice. You just have to get the app. But regardless of some of the quibbles I've heard people have with the game, I've also heard that it is an absolute blast to play, and it really, really captures the feel of Star Wars, and that this is more focused on the story than, once again, spending three hours with a blaster fight between six characters. So, but like I said, I have heard great things about this, and it is coming back to print, because one thing that has held people back is you couldn't get the books, because they were out of print, and they're not available in PDF. That's part of the agreement that Lucasfilm made was, yes, we'll do this role-playing game. You guys can have the license, but no PDFs, only physical books. Thankfully, the physical books are back. Either they're on the market now or they will be very, very soon. So one game that I should have mentioned with my fantasy role-playing games was Worlds Without Number from Sign Nominate Publishing. And it just slipped my mind. The reason it slipped my mind is because I didn't review it. If I remember correctly, Sammy Yuhas reviewed it for the Gaming Gang. So I haven't seen Worlds Without Number as much as I've heard really good things about it, I zoned. Now, as far as science fiction role-playing games, I would certainly not zone on Stars Without Number Although I haven't reviewed this either, I have heard fantastic things about Stars Without Number over the years. It is an old-school role-playing game. I can't tell you for certain if this is an OGL game or not. I think it might be. 
But I've also heard from many people that regardless of what science fiction role-playing game that you prefer, that you must have a copy of Stars Without Number because it makes for a fantastic toolbox for you to create alien races and distant planets and worlds and starships and situations. But that it also harbors an excellent old school driven role playing system as well. Kevin Crawford is very active as is the community around stars without number. And of course, also worlds without number, but that's a fantasy role playing game. I should have mentioned that in the other video, but moving right along. So I've, like I said, I've heard great things about stars without number. All right. Last role-playing game that I do not have a copy to share with you, although I have reviewed all of the major releases for it. Tales from the Loop from Free League Publishing. So everything about this is based on the artwork of Simon Stalinog and super, super cool. It's the 80s in Tales from the Loop. The player characters are all young teens or preteens. It's recommended not to kill off your player characters in Tales from the Loop. This is Stranger Things before there was a Stranger Things, but rather than horror, it's science fiction. And it's got two base settings, one in Sweden and one in, if I remember correctly, it's Boulder, Colorado off the top of my head. And really, really cool. I love the... 1980s setting for this and just how much attention to detail about the 1980s is included in this core book. And I'm like, yeah, oh my gosh, I remember that. Oh, I remember that because I was a young teen in the 1980s and really, really fun. This also utilizes the year one engine. One of the least crunchy uh, applications of the year one engine. In fact, it's pretty much traditional, uh, the approach to it. So it's the six-sided dice rolling a six to succeed and loads and loads of fun. If you're looking for a Stranger Things sort of experience that doesn't just ape Stranger Things, Tales from the Loop is fantastic. Also, there's things from The Flood, which advances the timeline to the 90s and you play player characters who are older teens and the kid gloves, no pun intended, come off because it's no longer not recommended that you kill player characters off, that player characters can die. And it, it's a bit of a darker uh, world uh, than Tales from the Loop. There's also our friends, the Machines, which is an adventure collection for Tales from the Loop. I will mention there's a starter set for this, I don't actually recommend. Amazingly enough, it is one of the only products that I've ever run across from Free League Publishing that I don't recommend. I just, there's not enough in it, in my opinion, especially compared to other starter sets that Free League Publishing has come out with, let alone other companies' starter sets as well. But Tales from the Loop, highly recommended. And quite different than anything else that's floating around out there. All right, so let's move on to some role-playing games that I can actually show you, even though I'm maybe just, you know, showing you the box. But we're going to stay with Free League Publishing and Alien, the role-playing game. And this has a starter set, which is excellent. There is tons packed into this starter set. So you've got your cinematic rules. So Alien, the role-playing game, has campaign rules and then cinematic rules. So the cinematic rules are, are really basically how to play the game. So the campaign rules have, like, the character creation rules, which are not in here. They're in the core book. But really everything else is in this, including an excellent first adventure. So you've got... Tons of custom dice. Off the top of my head, I think there's like 14 or 15 custom dice in here. They are six-siders because it does use a modified year one engine. 
ask for the proceedings. But cool handouts, uh, the box set adventures, which there's a, a trilogy of adventures that make up this overarching campaign. Really, really well done. And they all have decks of cards with NPCs, pre-gen characters, different equipment. Really, really top-notch. And this captures the world of Alien very, very well. And it's not only about the H.R. Geiger xenomorphs. There's a lot more to this than only that. You're not just going on bug hunts all the time. Highly recommend Alien, the role-playing game. Pick up the starter set. Dip your toes in. See if it's for you. But if you like Alien and Aliens and Prometheus and just about every other Alien movie out there and you just dig the setting, this is officially licensed. And Free League Publishing has done really, really well with their licensed IPs for sure. So if you are looking for a crunchy sort of military style role-playing game, then I would certainly recommend you might want to take a peek at Battle Lords of the 23rd Century from 23rd Century Productions. And this is a big tome. This is a heavy book. I believe this is the eighth edition of this rule set. And I have had people tell me that this isn't as crunchy as it once was. And there are some players out there, some gamers out there, who, who've complained that, oh, you know, you've, you've, you've slimmed it down, you've trimmed it down too much. We want all that crunch back. Well, I'm telling you, there's a good amount of rules complexity to this. Now, it's got pretty much everything and the kitchen sink in here. So even though I said, oh, if you're looking for kind of a military-based you can play any sort of science fiction. You can go from more like epic space opera to hard science fiction as well, very easily with Battle Lords of the 23rd Century. I will mention there's not really a ton of content out there for this edition. There is a supplement that came out, but to my knowledge, I think that's all that's out there. There might be an adventure or two. So keep in mind, you're probably going to have to do some homebrewing if you are picking up Battle Lords of the 23rd Century. Next up, another Free League publishing release. I told you, you're going to hear from these guys a lot. It's another licensed IP, and it came out pretty recently. It is Blade Runner. Now, this is the starter set. And I'll point out, I actually gave the starter set a higher review score than the core rule book because this is just jam packed with goodies. There are so many cool handouts for your player characters to really immerse them in the adventure. It also includes the first chapter of an ongoing campaign for Blade Runner. Players can take on the roles of humans or replicants. So this is actually taking place between Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2047? 2047 or 2049? Oops. You know that second Blade Runner movie that's awesome, but also flopped at the box office? Well, it takes place between those two movies. Really, really well done. Uh, pre-gen characters, no character creation rules. That's one of the things that usually happens with these starter sets. But I really definitely recommend, if you want to check out Blade Runner, pick this up. Something else that's really well done with this is the whole police procedural process. Because you play as a Blade Runner. There are no options to play anything else. Now, there are different types, you have different archetypes, but you're all working for the LAPD, and you are Blade Runners. So I love how the whole 
procedure of investigation is tackled in Blade Runner as well. Top notch, really well done. We'll talk about another licensed IP. And if you're a fan of Doctor Who, you owe it to yourself to pick up Doctor Who second edition. Now, this is the starter set here. And I really dig the second edition of Doctor Who. I like the first. I like the second better. I think they've cleaned up some of the... No, it was a little wonky, I guess. My original review for the Doctor Who role-playing game was positive. I recommended it, but it wasn't like my highest recommendation. I really like some of the minor changes that have been done with this second edition. This is another starter set that is just jam-packed with everything you need to play Doctor Who. One cool aspect of this is you don't even have to have the Doctor. So you could easily play adventures where you're like Jack Harkness, right? That time core that he's part of. Not Torchwood. Prior to that. Maybe it's after that. But you could play Time Travelers and not even utilize the Doctor or any of the companions, which in some ways I probably recommend if you have a bunch of players, because sometimes it's like, you know, okay, so they're, they're the Doctor, why, why can't I be the Doctor? <laughs> I want to be the Doctor. I don't want to be a companion. You know what I mean. Really, really well done. One thing that I absolutely adore about this line are the Doctor Source books that Cubicle 7 Entertainment has produced. Now, they are for the first edition, but the changes to second edition, like I said, are, are relatively minor. I think the conversion information is all of like two or three pages in the new core rulebook. And these source books are stunning. Anything you want to know about each of the Doctors is contained in these source books, as well as every adventure, every televised adventure is broken up and presented as adventure nuggets, as well as if you wanted to continue the story from where the episode left off. Man, it is fantastic. There's even a book for Paul McGann's Doctor. There isn't one yet for Jodie Whittaker, which... You can see why. I mean, she just finished up being the Doctor. We don't even have the return of David Tennant yet. But man, really, really good. You will certainly enjoy Doctor Who's second edition if you enjoy Doctor Who and want to role play in that world. So I mentioned Dune earlier. Well, Modivius Entertainment has put together just an amazing product with their Dune Adventures in the Imperium. Excellent core rule book. This is more of a storytelling game where you're going from act to act with scenes as opposed to like a sandboxy sort of game. So for some folks that, that kind of railroad doesn't appeal to them, but I'm telling you, this is certainly worth picking up. Now, this is Agents of Dune, which is not called a starter set, but it really is the starter set for Dune. And it includes the first chapter of an ongoing campaign. Everything you need to play is in here. Once again, loads of really cool handouts for the players to really build that immersion into the world of Arrakis. And in my opinion... The selling point of this starter set that's not called a starter set is that the story, which is continued, it's not just for this box set. It's an ongoing campaign. The player character's house has been tasked by the emperor to oversee the spice mining on Arrakis, not House of Treaties. Very, very cool. You've got pre-gens and everything in here as well. 
and a top-notch first chapter to that campaign. Loads of gaming material included in this box, and the core rulebook is excellent as well. Moon Ride Long, we're, we're talking about a lot of licensed IPs, but the thing is, we've seen a lot of really good science fiction IPs get the role-playing game treatment, and Fallout is no exception. Now, this is also from Modifius Entertainment, and if you enjoy the crafting aspects of video games, you're going to definitely dig this. Now, there are a few Fallout titles from Modifius, so can be a little confusing because there's the uh, miniatures game, and then there's a game, uh, game book, I should say, which brings sort of role-playing aspects to the miniatures game. Well, this is Fallout, the role-playing game. So this is all in all a role-playing game, no miniatures required to be able to play it. And very, very well done by Modifius Entertainment. They've really brought the world of Fallout to life. Now, I know there are some folks out there who they don't like the combat system as much as they thought they would. Uh, and there's, there's like range bans. And I think people were expecting where it's like, oh, the range of this pistol is so many yards. Well, it doesn't really work that way, but it's to kind of make this a little less crunchy than it could have been. Now, this is not a rules-like game, and it does utilize the 2D20 system that Modifius Entertainment is known for. And I would say with Fallout, it's about middle-of-the-road complexity as far as those mechanics go. Uh, the crunchiest of all, I think maybe Conan Adventures in an Age Undreamed of. I'm actually going to talk about what I think are the least crunchy of the 2D20 mechanics in just a few moments. I would say maybe it's Aktung Cthulhu 2D20, but I haven't had an opportunity to see that. But all in all, with Fallout, really, really well done. And all in all, it's not as complex as you might think. Next up, something that's not a licensed IP, but it is a game that has a second edition coming out because it successfully kickstarted, and that is Mothership from Tuesday Night Games. And everybody just loves Mothership. And as you can see, not a whole heck of a lot to it. Pretty short. The second edition is going to really expand on this. But if you are a fan of movies like, say, Alien, but you don't necessarily want the Alien game world or the old Sean Connery movie Outland, movies along those lines that are kind of darker and grittier, then you will certainly enjoy Mothership. This is one of those sort of old school inspired role playing games that has loads and loads of tables that you can roll on to really get those creative juices flowing. It's not a rules heavy game by any stretch of the imagination, but really, really impressive uh, for a small publisher. And I didn't review this simply because when I picked this up, I didn't receive this as a review copy. I actually bought this. After I bought it is when the Kickstarter for the second edition started. So I thought, I uh, guess I'll wait till the second edition comes out. But this is really, really cool. Really good. Next up, we've got Mutant Crawl Classics from Goodman Games. So if you saw the fantasy role-playing game video, I really like the Dungeon Crawl Classics. Yes, it's open game license. This is open game license. I don't think there's much we have to worry about for Dungeon Crawl Classics and Mutant Crawl Classics. For one, there is tons of content out there, and you can convert over tons of already published adventures over the years to both DCC and MCC. But if you're looking for kind of a 
Gamma World vibe without going to Gamma World, then MCC is a lot of fun. I will mention I am not as fond of Mutant Crawl Classics as I am Dungeon Crawl Classics, and that's because Mutant Crawl Classics just doesn't have as much content in its core rule book. Whereas the Dungeon Crawl Classics is just jam-packed with goodies. And I think this is just a little light. I would have liked to have seen about 100 more pages with content about the game world and some additional mechanics and that. But if you're into, like, mutations and, and things like that, you will definitely dig it. As far as the player characters, we've got a lot of different sort of uh, aspects you can go for. You, can, you don't have to necessarily be just human or mutant. There's a lot of things cooking under the hood for Mutant Crawl Classics. And once again, I have a soft spot for fun role-playing games. Mutant Crawl Classics is fun. So another open game license game, and from a company that people are concerned about, depending on what happens with his open game license 1.1 1 .1 is Paizo Inc. And of course I'm talking about Starfinder and Starfinder. When we're talking fun role-playing games, you got it. You got to include Starfinder into the mix because you have got so many options available to you. That's one of the things with Pathfinder and Starfinder that I tell people all the time, if you're looking as a player for just a near unimaginable number of options, as far as your character, you got to take a peek. Now, Starfinder is not hard science fiction. Starfinder is space fantasy. It's epic. And I know a lot of people out there, they, they look at the Paizo releases and they're like, oh, it's math finder. Yes, a little more complex than 5e, but not by much. I mean, you've got just as much math in 5th edition D&D as you do in Pathfinder and Starfinder. It's just approached differently. But one aspect of any of the Paizo RPGs is the sheer amount of content that comes out every single month. You've got a new chapter at least for the adventure paths. Yes. Okay. With the pandemic, we had some months where we didn't get one, but normally you're looking at each and every month. There are new adventures for Starfinder and they're pretty good. They are pretty good. Like I said, it's more space fantasy than traditional science fiction, but still loads of fun. And this is another starter set that is just absolutely jam-packed with gaming goodness. I gave this really high marks with my review. In fact, so did the, the Pathfinder starter set. Also got great marks. All right, so we talked about Star Wars. Well, we also have Star Trek. And that is also from Modifius Entertainment. Now, this is actually from their Tricorder Collector's set so it actually comes in a box like this which opens up like a tricorder it's actually got a strap inside it's got dice it's got everything you need to get started with uh star trek star trek adventures to be precise and this is the core rule book it's just in kind of a pocket size but one of the things that i love is it's kind of pocket size, but you can still read the font. <laughs> and being 55 years old, I appreciate it not being super, super tiny. So this does utilize the 2D20 system that Modifius Entertainment is known for. But it is the lightest from my uh, experiences with the Modifius Entertainment role-playing games that I've reviewed. Now, I haven't reviewed them all. But this is the lightest approach. I think it's right there with like John Carter. They do a John Carter role-playing game as, uh, also. But 
easy to get into. It's not super difficult to wrap your heads around the 2D20 mechanics. And there's loads of content. And if there's a particular Trek era that you're a fan of, you're in luck because this covers all of them. In fact, even Discovery now has source books and supplements and adventures for that setting. Uh, nothing from Strange New Worlds yet, but I wouldn't expect that. I mean, it's not even the second season out yet. But And, of course, that's closer to the original series, too. But if you're a fan of Star Trek and you love role-playing games and you haven't picked up Star Trek Adventures, you don't love Star Trek. It is that good. It is really, really good. You can check out my written review of the core rule book that I did. Not, it's the same thing as this. This just happened to come with the uh, tricorder kit. And it's actually the only copy I've got. I, it's the only Star Trek uh, release that I actually have a physical copy of. All right. If you're looking for something that's really different, and it's also kind of a throwback to a classic role-playing game, you might want to take a peek at Torg Eternity from Ulysses Spiel. So Torg came out, it was from West End Games, and it was really different. So the Earth has been invaded by these, what's known as cosms. They're like dimensions. And there's this mastermind villain behind all of it. And these cosms actually take over different parts of the earth. So you have parts of the world that have been unaffected by this invasion. And then you have others that have been completely reshaped by these cosms. And it's pretty interesting because you have all these different genres. So you've got the living lands, which is like prehistoric. And then you also have the Cyber Papacy, which is cyberpunk. And you've got the Nile Empire, which is 1930s pulp adventure. And really, really cool. Now, one of the cool things about Torg Eternity is, to my knowledge, I think all of the Cosms have been released now because they have kickstarted for the past few years. And I think all of them now have their core supplements, an adventure book, at least one adventure book, kind of an ongoing campaign for each of the settings as well. And, of course, it all uses one standard mechanic. Now, there are some additional purchases that you kind of need to get the most out of this. So there's, like, decks of cards that you utilize for action resolution and things like that. There's dice as well, don't get me wrong. So there is that, that I gotta be honest, I'm not super keen on, but the setting itself and the game itself, pretty cool, really nice job from Ulysses Spiel and they have continued to support this, which is important as well. So no video about science fiction role-playing games would be complete without a mention of Traveler. And this is the Mongoose second edition of Traveler. Traveler can be confusing for people because there are different versions of Traveler out there. So, of course, we've got classic Traveler, we've got, which came out in the 70s, which came out in a little black box, which I had. And that was from Game Designers Workshop. But the interesting thing is, all these years later, this second edition Mongoose, because Mongoose released a Traveler, and now this is the updated second edition of that Traveler. These are still pretty compatible with those old adventures, <laughs> incredibly enough. I really like the job Traveler has done. Traveler takes more of a... Well, you can obviously play space opera. You can do whatever you want, but the setting of Traveler is more of a hard science fiction setting. And you can have epic adventures, you can have high adventure, 
But all in all, it's there's more science in this science fiction than in other science fiction role-playing games. But you've got loads of content that's out there. Uh, Seth, is it Skirkowski? I apologize. I'm sure I've mispronounced his name. Does all these really awesome videos about Traveler and Traveler Adventures. Not only really entertaining, but very informative as well. And just watching some of his videos, you'll see why Traveler is as respected as it is as far as a science fiction role-playing game. And the Mongoose edition is really, really well done. One drawback I have to mention is it can be pricey. So this tends to be a pricier role-playing game than others you may pick up. So this is a starter set, but this starter set actually includes two books which compile the core rule book. So it's really the core rule book broken into two books, as well as an adventure, dice, other content as well. And off the top of my head, I think this retails for $80. So of course, quite different than most starter sets out there. But even though this says this is a starter set, it is the core book. It's the core rules. You're not missing out on anything. So there isn't anything else you need to purchase. So I really like Traveler. And certainly if you're looking for more of the, it's not really old school. It's just more of a, a different approach. It's, it's rolling 2D6 and having modifiers and looking to, you know, roll a certain number or higher. That's really all the rules of Traveler have ever been. So there is complexity to it, but I know some people are, are scared off by the complexity, especially of creating starships and operating starships. It's not that difficult to get into. So Traveler, second edition from Mongoose Publishing. Huge thumbs up. I really do like the starter set quite a lot. All right, I have one final role-playing game to share with you, and it is Warhammer 40K Wrath and Glory from Cubicle 7 Entertainment. So if you're a fan of Warhammer 40K, you know there have been umpteen different role-playing games from that setting over the years, and they have been all very different from one another, right? Especially when it was with uh, Fantasy Flight Games, they had a multitude of different Warhammer 40K role-playing titles that all tackle different aspects of that game world. Well, the same is kind of true here. So Wrath and Glory is set in a particular sector that has been cut off from the rest of space. So you'll find that you will, as player characters, you'll have alliances with races and Xenos and factions that you would never have considered in the game world of Warhammer 40K to ally with. But because it's a fight against chaos, you find, of course, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Now, I do know there are people out there who just really dislike that. They're like, oh, there's no way Space Marines would do that. So if you are, you know, that intense about your Warhammer 40K, this probably isn't going to be for you. But I think it's pretty damn cool. Now, this originally came out from uh, Ulysses Spiel. And then, for various different reasons, they lost it. And it went to Cubicle 7 Entertainment. And Cubicle 7 Entertainment has done really well with this. And they have supported this really well. Which, the reality is, this wasn't their game. This wasn't their game system, mechanically. So kudos to Cubicle 7 Entertainment for really supporting this quite well. I will mention there is a new Warhammer 40K role-playing game that is on the horizon from Cubicle 7 Entertainment. I know very little about it, if practically nothing about it, but it is going to be uh, an absolutely completely different kind of theme than Wrath and Glory. So in all honesty, and I don't have any inside dope or anything like that, I don't know 
how much support Cubicle 7 Entertainment is going to devote to Wrath and Glory once that other Warhammer 40K role-playing game comes out. I mean, they could continue the same way they've been doing for the past few years. I just don't know. I, I'm just being very, very honest. But I really like Warhammer 40K, Wrath and Glory from Cubicle 7 Entertainment. So there you have it, 22. What I consider to be stellar. Ah, you see what I did there. Science fiction role-playing games. Yes, I know it's not that clever. <laughs> Just, you know. That I feel are certainly deserving of your attention and a place at your gaming table. I really like these. I can personally recommend just about each and every one of them. All right, that is it for this time out. If you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell, because it'll not only let you know when I upload videos such as this one, it'll also inform you when my live stream Gaming Gang Dispatch airs Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Central right here on YouTube. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, it'll, by all means, make your way on over to thegaminggang.com for all the latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you won't find here on the YouTube channel. So, Thank you very much for taking time out to hang out and listen to my recommendations of science fiction role-playing games. And until I see you next time, here's hoping each and every one of you gets to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, that's okay. You don't have to leave just yet. In fact, why don't you subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel right here or take a peek at the latest live stream or even find out what YouTube recommends you check out from the channel. And of course, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thanks again for watching.